Seed of Doubt Written by Neil McIntosh Read by Adam Nichol It had seemed an eternity, waiting for the life raft to crash. Sitting hunched in a tiny cabin, Danielle had watched the patchwork face of the planet inflating like a balloon as the raft fell towards it. Auras of death glittered, beckoning in her mind. The end of the mothership had been written in the instant when the warp storm had burst around them. The storm's rage had passed in a moment, time enough to hurl a great fist against the hull and chart the ship a new course a superheated spiral dive towards the planet Kabalas. There had only been two rafts. One, at least, had made it. She was still alive. Just for now, Valdez was leaving her alone. The Inquisitor was preoccupied with his inventory of equipment. How much salvaged from the ship? How much of that still intact? Danielle wondered about the other survivors, something that would interest Valdez only selectively. Who? How useful, or how dangerous. She had watched the launch of the second raft soon after their escape in the first, but maybe not soon enough. And she remembered her last sight of the Spirit of Salvation, a red glow against the black glaze of space, twisting in its final arc towards destruction. Aboard, five hundred souls. Cargo bound for Earth, final terminus of the Imperium. She had reached into their minds, shared the final moments. Most were stricken with an animal panic, but there had been a few who had already seen, and they were calm in the face of an early death. Not for the first time in her life, Danielle was a survivor. And she was alone. Riders on horseback approached the wreck of the life raft. Shabby soldiers decked out in the style of old frontiersmen of the Imperium. Greasy denim. Leather jerkins overlaid with bandoliers of bullets. The faded badges the soldiers were wearing were for pioneer battles fought and won long before they had been born. Inquisitor Mendor Valdez strode out to beat the Cabalians, his brief nod telling Daniel to follow. A rider with a golden signia splashed over his chest pulled forward and raised a sloppy salute. Any more survivors? Valdez sized up the reception party. Aside from the troopers, there were four spur horses leached together in a line at the rear. We need to be taken to the Tithe Marshal, he stated. He turned to Danielle. Any trace from the Psyker? Danielle closed her eyes and searched. Yes, she said at last. Not far from here, but the signal's weak. Hold on to it, said Valdez. We're going to run the operation as scheduled. Even now? Valdez looked around the wreckage of the raft, massaging his bruised ribs. Especially now, he said. What chance, Chuck? A stocky, keg-shaped figure emerged from the hull of the raft, Laswell clutched like a weapon in a leather-skinned hand. The Cabalians eyed the abhuman, mistrustfully. Valdez spat out his pain in a sour sneer. Don't fret. He's staying here. Well, Jack, what have we got? The squat grimaced, running a hand through coils of oily hair. Good orcs will have a better kit than what I've got to work with. He paused and traded stairs with the horseman before continuing. Give me a while, and I might be able to squeeze a squeak out the comnet. Valdez grinned, briefly. You'll make guild master yet. Chuck grunted, unappreciative. Just think yourself lucky you dropped out the sky with the two best engineers in the Imperium on board. Hey, Golan. A second squat, younger and slimmer than his comrade, stepped from the cabin. Eyes darting behind slits cut in the brightly painted fealty mask, stitched into the skin of his face. Oh, we'll fix it, sir, Golan affirmed. Every hour spent on this dung heap is one too many for me. Then we'll leave it in your capable hands. Now, Valdez turned to the Cabalians. Lead the way. Let me get a move on. Danielle rode at the rear of the procession. Away from the babble of voices, she could clearly read what was passing through the minds of the Cabalian troopers. Behind the facades of cheerful banter, she found suspicion, mistrust, and fear. She looked out through their eyes and saw Valdez, saw herself as they saw them. Ambassadors from a distant emperor. Bringers of uncertainty to a sleepy, ordered world. 
buttons. She made no attempt to steal through the aura cast like a halo of ice around Inquisitor Valdez, although it would have been easy, like lifting trinkets from a blind man's stall. Unlike many of his order, Valdez had no mind sight, no powers beyond other mortal men. He had climbed the Imperial ranks, fueled by instinct and the primal urge to fight, and to win. What she had found in Valdez's mind, the linkered refusal to countenance any uncertainty, any deviation from the one path, depressed and confused her. The Inquisitor had forged his limitations into a weapon to be used against anyone who saw, who questioned too much. She had long accepted that his mistrust of her bordered on hatred. The horses climbed out of the valley onto the great plains of Cabalas. Danielle looked down upon fields of wheat grown as tall as men that swayed in great dreaming waves. At the edges of the gold sea, nests of green tangle fungus competed for space in the rich soil. The tithe domains of Cabalas formed one of the Imperium's great storehouses. Here, as throughout the galaxy, the struggle between order and disintegration continued unabated. Teams of men worked the fields, purging gouts of choking weed from the path of the harvesters. They stopped to stare at the upworlders as they passed above. The message on their faces was the same. These are intruders. Danielle avoided their gaze. Beyond the steel-grey grain spires that ringed the distant settlement, a lone siren voice still called. Although each step brought them closer, the voice was fading. Hold on. Danielle heard herself saying, but she knew it would be too late. She looked up. The Inquisitor had halted the column and was looking back at her, blue eyes probing, searching. Well, he demanded, what is it? The signal's weakening. I thought for a moment I'd lost it. Valdez waved her forward impatiently. Ride up here with me. Danielle obeyed. As she drew level with the Inquisitor, she noticed he was sitting lopsided in the saddle hand braced hard against his side. She sensed pain, and Valdez's stubborn refusal to weaken. Let me help, she said to Flo. I have healing powers. I can... Valdez tugged at the reins, urging his horse on. Don't waste your spells on me, he snapped. Save them for the service of the Imperium. In the Emperor's name, we may need them yet. Pythe Marshal Shani led his visitors to a portal, and waved an arm across the expanse that comprised his kingdom. Amazing, isn't it? Everything grows here, he chuckled. <laughs> Everything tries. He handed them glasses of wine. You won't taste better than this anywhere. He took a sip from his own glass and shuffled into the room, watching the Inquisitor as he might a barometer. If it's the quotas you've come about, there won't be any repeat of what happened last meal time. You have my word for it. Valdez drained his glass without pausing. Rot your quotas, he said. The Emperor doesn't send me as a tax cut. He leant against the portal rim, gazing down on the sprawling steel structures below. Somewhere in this settlement there's a psyker. That's the cargo we came to collect. Shani looked doubtfully from the Inquisitor to Danielle. His mind was insular, protected by instinct. Before he could reply, she said, We know about her. I was tracking the signal before we reached orbit. Shani squinted hard at her and refilled his glass. You're one of them too. Aren't you? Danielle nodded. Like, but stronger. The woman of the Seeky may be afflicted by a power she can't control. Shani shrugged. All right, all right. We've got nothing to hide. We can mind our own affairs, that's all. Save the sermons, Valdez said, patience exhausted. Just tell us where the mutant is. Shani drew himself up, puffing out his chest self-importantly. I'll take you there myself, he said. But you'll find you've had a wasted journey. The old couple sat hunched by a low wooden bed, heads bowed in the attitude of those preparing for mourning. The room was a grey cell, lit only by the dusty beams of light that pierced the curtained windows. A single sheet was drawn across the outline of a figure lying on the bed. As Valdez and Daniel entered, the shape stirred. Once. Daniel stepped forward. See? Shani muttered peevishly. It's over. Don't get too close, Valdez warned. I know what I'm doing. The couple looked up. Without explanation, they allowed her to approach the bed. She can't see or hear you, said the old woman. She looked through Danielle, staring into nothing. Danielle laid a hand on the woman's shoulder. It's all right, 
he said. She knows I'm here. The head buried deep in the pillow turned towards her. An eye peeled open. A milk-white clouded bead. A voice whispered in Daniel's mind. A butterfly might be. Sister. I hear you, Daniel replied. Can you still speak to us? The girl's face was swollen and dark, as though covered in a massive bruise. Danielle stooped low to hear the word, Astartes. She looked up. What does that mean? she said to the old woman. Is that a place? On hearing, the woman stared at the wall. Her husband rose slowly and took Danielle aside. Astartes is her brother, he explained. The only one of the family who could stay near her once the sickness was on her. When did this sickness start? Valdez asked, quietly. With the storms, the old man bowed his head. We thought it was just fever. Then she became racked with spasms, violent, terrible. It was though she'd become, Valdez supplied the word, possessed. The man looked up, fear mixing with his grief. Aye, he agreed. Jula fought for a soul. It's cost her a life. Valdez looked pensive. And where is Gisartes? As if woken from a spell, the old woman spoke. Gone, she said. He tended her into the long night, even though he feared the sickness had tainted him. When we woke at dawn, he'd gone, she repeated the word. Gone. Both of them. Gone. Valdez turned quickly to the marshal. Find this man, he commanded. I don't care what it takes. Just do it. Now. Shani hesitated for a moment, lips forming around a mumbled protest. He caught the look in the Inquisitor's eye and nodded assent. Valdez beckoned to Danielle. We'll step outside and wait where there's cleaner air. She followed the Inquisitor out into the daylight. The storms they mentioned. And the warp storm. Valdez nodded. The same. The warp seethed with energy, perhaps with the energy of one of the dark powers themselves. Do you think the Lord of Decay? Yes, said Valdez. And that fool Shani talks as though a little quarantine's going to end his problems. He cast a scornful glance towards the departing figure of the Marshal. Not this time, my friend. The Emperor alone knows what virulence the warp has set free. Pray that Chuck gets through to Cardinesh. Quotas or no quotas. The Imperium may have to dispense with Kabalas. But surely, dismay tinged her voice, surely the infestation has waned. The girl's no harm to anyone now. The girl. Valdez chewed the word out contemptuously. One less psycho worm to blight the Imperium. But while she still lived, she was an open channel for the poisons of chaos. Now, the infection's running in her brother's veins. Who can say how fast that seed may spread? And when we find Gestatis? Kill him! That'll be the start. Danielle had reached into the minds of the grieving family. She knew that they, even Shani, pumped up with his pompous vanity, were innocent souls. Try as she might, she could not approach the cold serenity in which the Inquisitor would dispatch them all. How can you be sure the infection has spread from the warp? Already she knew the argument was lost. Valdez closed his hand into a white-knuckled fist and held it under her gaze. I don't need to be sure, he thundered. Doubt, doubt is all I need. Doubt like a maggot burrowed in the fabric of the universe. Valdez drew a finger down Danielle's cheek. And remember, I have doubt of you, too. Danielle flinched away. I've been tested, she countered. I've never faltered in the service of the Imperium. She felt intimidated, and despised herself for it. Valdez dropped his fist in a gesture of disdain. There's always a first time, he said acidically, and I'll tell you something else. The communicator clipped to the Inquisitor's belt started to flash red. Both of them looked down at it in surprise before Valdez found the presence of mind to free the device and flip it open. Chuck's broad, lupine grin was a disarming but not unwelcome sight. How's that for service? he demanded. Valdez cheered up immediately. Thank the Emperor for engineers. Have you reached Cardunesh? Chuck frowned, irritated. Don't expect the Imperium in a day. We'll be working flat out just to patch local comm channels. All right. Keep at it. 
In the meantime, see if you can raise the other raft. Grunland's a good soldier. He'll have pulled his boys through, if anyone can. Okay, boss. Got trouble? Valdez snorted and snapped the communicator shut. Marshal Sharney was back within the hour. The little man's face was flushed with an unaccustomed urgency. My stewards have looked everywhere. Everywhere, he protested. Not a corner of the settlement's been overlooked. Don't tell me, Valdez sighed. The little bird has flown. Well, he wasn't under arrest, you know. Sharney's indignation was hollow. He began shuffling from foot to foot, as though under a sentence of execution. He was spared by a cry from the house. Jeweler's struggle was ending. Her body writhed in the last throes of battle, blind eyes rolling marble white, searching. As Daniel entered, the young woman grew calmer and sat upright. Clusters of dark tumours were spreading across her face and neck, making her almost unrecognisable. Daniel crouched close to Jeweler's side to hear the two whispered words. Status. Modessa. She died before Daniel could reply. Valdez doffed his hat and began to fan his face. Mordessa, he murmured. What's the significance of that? It's a ghost town, a derelict, Shani replied, discomforted. We don't know it by that name any more. Jula's father rose, anger stemming the tears. We still know it by that name. Tell them what it is. Shani fiddled nervously with his chain of office. The old woman spoke without looking up. It's the Blake village. Valdez took Shani by the collar and drew him in until the two men were face to face. Then this has happened before. Shani was fast getting out of his depth. Maybe, he stammered. I don't know. The girl's symptoms are similar. Tell us about Mordessa, Valdez suggested. It was over long ago, a century at least. There was another outbreak of sickness. Another psyker? I go with, I don't know, one of the so-called powers. He glared defiantly at his interrogators. No, the Imperium never got to hear of it. I told you, we can handle our own affairs on Kabbalath. Mordessa. The name stirred in Daniel's soul. Shani had told the truth as he had understood it, but there was more. Mordessa, an old name, far older than the pioneers of Kabbalas. Older, perhaps, than the Imperium itself. A shadow of a struggle, ancient beyond memory, flickered in her mind, and then fled. So, he said, what was done? Shani sat down and cupped his head in his hands. The colony was new. The first habitation of Kabbalah in the age of strife. Towns and villages were small, easily contained. Guards were posted. No one was allowed in or out of the village. Danielle kept probing. And, and then? Shani shrugged. And then? The father's face was puffy, red. Then they put the village to the flames. A hundred men, women and children died. No one has lived there since. You think Gestatus may have gone there? The old man laughed bitterly. <laughs> Where else would a leper go? Valdez led Shani, unresisting, back to the marshalry issuing orders as he thought of them. Far from dismaying him, the news had sharpened his natural instincts of war. For the first time since the crash, Danielle saw him invigorated with a sense of purpose. I want your horses, and you'd better let me have half a dozen of your men. Armed. Oh, and one more thing. He paused and glanced at the covered beer. See to it that that body is burned. That's difficult, Shani mumbled. It's a practice from Kabbalah to bury the dead. Burn it! It was not a request. A brief smile flicked on the Inquisitor's face as he walked over to the beer. Oh, would you care to bury this? A stench of decay filled the courtyard as the Inquisitor lifted the shroud. Daniel glanced once at the body and turned quickly away. Shani looked as though he was about to be sick. He summoned guards with an urgent wave of his hand. Burn it! he said. Burn it at once! Chuck's heavy features knotted into a frown. That's bad, he said. Could be messy, but there's some better news. At least we're going to have some company. The Inquisitor's features lit up in delight. For a moment, Daniel expected him to drop his saddlebags and hug her. How many safe? he demanded. Grunland among them? 
Grunland? Aye. Franker too. Plotvich and Van Meer. The raft hit the hills about sixty kilometres north. Took it worse than ours. Brody was aboard, but didn't make it. Rest the lads flamed with the ship. Valdez tapped the communicator, thoughtfully. Not bad. Survival rate has exceeded probability. It was as much as could be expected. Get back to Grunland with my commendation. Explain the position and tell him to get his men to the northern approach to Mondessa. And no further. We'll meet them there. Now, what about Cardinesh? All the military channels are shot. We're going to have to try and pick up one of the freight channels. Gollum's working on it. It'll take time, that's all. Valdez made a brief inspection of the Cabalian guides. Six thin youths fidgeted uneasily in the saddle, waiting for the order to move out. The Inquisitor frowned. Engineer, are you still needed there? Chuck shrugged. I could sit here holding the lad's hand, I suppose. Fact is, he can patch in a comnet with his eyes closed. In that case, he'll be more useful with us. If you set off within the hour, we'll meet up well before nightfall. Chuck's brow furrowed. My battle drag was left on the ship, remember? Valdez grinned down at the worried face on the screen. Then treat yourself to some exercise, engineer. Your legs could use stretching. Oh, and Chuck. The chestnut face reappeared, appetite for battle tainted by the prospect of a long trudge. Yeah, boss. Well done. The metal road out of the settlement beat a path through scenes from a well-run war. The land was cut into vast squares, fields of cultivated vegetation stretching to the horizons. Where the man-made plateaus ended, legions of alien plant life erupted like a virus, tracing lines into the land, slicing it into chessboard squares. As the journey wore on, closer to the site of Mordessa, the terms of the battle altered. Men grew sparse in the fields, and then disappeared. The hard-fought squares of industry became straggling expenses of thin, untended crops. Even the tangleweeds had given up. Grey rather than green, they sprouted now in, in intermittent limp clusters, as though the land had lost all nourishment. In time, the idle chatter of the Cabalian troopers gave way to an uneasy silence. By late afternoon, new growths were flourishing amongst the wild corn. Strange black fungi like mutated rain spore. They oozed a scent of death. Oh there! A stump-legged figure was striding through the field towards them, scything down crop and rotting fungus with casual strokes of an improvised bamboo cane. Chuck was perspiring with the weight of an obscenely huge field gun that he'd salvaged from the raft. He was propelling himself towards the riders at an unlikely pace, powered in equal measure by determination, and bitter curses heaped upon the engineer's lot. He reached the roadway, keeping a wary eye on the Gabalian troops. What's this, then? More for eight and jackrabbits? Valdez laughed, a band of heroes to fight for the Imperium. What news? Chuck spat against his sleeve and polished the gun barrel with great deliberation. golan has got it in hand. He'll have card to nest for us, soon enough. Meanwhile, I've left him strict orders. He glared briefly at the Gabalians. To skewer any little pigs that come snuffling too close to our business. Valdez nodded, satisfied. Ride up here with me. We'll reach the village soon after dusk. Night came quickly, as though the dark growths thickening in the fields were leaching the light from the sky. The smooth, paved roadway became no more than a rutted, overgrown path. Few travellers had ventured to this way. Danielle reached out, beyond Chuck's brutish good humour and the Inquisitor's sharpening scent for slaughter into the gathering night. She saw no shadow of living man, but somewhere in the gloom ahead, she sensed the first stirrings in a darker well, its epicentre a pool of blackness so deep the universe itself may drown within it. Somewhere, a clock, long stopped, began to mark time again. Old wounds began to reopen. They had reached their journey's end. At first sight, Mordessa could have been just another small colony village. A crop of low buildings nestled together in a shallow valley, a spire visible above the rooftops. But, off to one side, Danielle saw other structures. The remains of walls, fluted and curved, inlaid with strange webbed patterns. Something in their line and form suggested an older, pre-human presence, as though the pioneers of the Imperium had built their village beside the remnants of another, long-departed race. 
Now, Mordessa too was dead. As they drew closer, the village was revealed as a charcoal shell, a skeletal frame of scorched iron and blackened timber. The spire presided over a grave. The Cabalian captain shook his head ruefully. This is an unlucky place. Danielle dismounted and followed Valdez down the path to a barricade. And followed Valdez down the path to a barricade of rusting razor fence. A signboard, faded and rotten, still clung to the wire. The legend had been obscured, but the crude depiction of a skull was still clear enough. The warning just hadn't been heeded. Beyond the path, the fence had been prized apart. The sound of feet slithering on stones came out from the darkness ahead of them. Cabalian fingers sweated on rifle stocks. A voice called out in greeting. Hey, hold your fire. Friend! The Inquisitor's expression betrayed his astonishment. Van Meer? He spoke softly, seeking cooperation from his companions. Chuck shook his head slowly in admiration and disbelief. He's a better man than I. It should have taken him another hour to reach this place. Danielle stayed silent. The voice was Van Meer's. She needed no special powers to recognize that, and yet she bit back a warning as a tall, powerfully built man, dressed in the night colors of the Third Army of Cardinesh, emerged from the shadows. Sergeant Van Meer strode up the road leading from Mordessa, a unidentified load straddling his broad shoulders. The grin on his face was almost as wide. Inquisitor Valdez returned his salute. Greetings, Sergeant. The Third Army surpasses itself yet again. Captain Grunlund's felicitations, your worship. He says you this little offering. He shifted his load over to one shoulder. Rich pickings. The body of a man tumbled from the sack onto the ground. Valdez turned to the Cabalians. Get started. The troop captain, Tolman, nodded nervously. That's him. The Emperor knows he never does any harm. Nor will he. Now, how did you come by this fortuitous catch? Our paths met as we approached the village from the east. The mutant ran right into our arms. He was so ripe with the sickness of evil, he barely knew where he was. Van Meer flourished his bolt pistol. A few rounds of this was all the medicine he needed. Gestatus stared up at the stars, dead eyes fixed in a mask of blistered wax. Valdez prodded the corpse with a booted face. We'll take this and burn it, he said thoughtfully. Are the rest of the men far? Not far at all. Captain Grunland searching the village as a precautionary measure. Good. Let's hope that this is the last of an unwelcome line. I'm sure of it, Van Meer said. I've met these diseased mutants before, on Edmund's world. See this? He turned Gisartus' face with one heel, exposing a dark crop of welts. Until these pretties blossom out, the infection can't take. We caught him just in time. Not true. A voice, anonymous but certain, spoke in Daniel's mind. Where did your raft crash? She asked the question even before she was fully aware of it. Van Meer looked perplexed, taken aback. What's this? Budding Inquisitor? Vexed, Valdez turned to her, but his words were lost. The nebulous darkness which had been bearing down on her suddenly focused. The raft crashed here, not in the hills. They never left the village. Valdez was striding out to meet Van Meer, hand extended. Danielle reached deep into the soldier's mind. The physical outline of Van Meer faded out of mind sight. Beneath it, Valdez, wait! The moment froze. Valdez stood only feet away from the sergeant, surprise turning into anger. Danielle was taken off guard by the urgency in her own voice. Then she found the words. Don't get near him. That's not Van Meer anymore. Van Meer is dead. Cabellians slipped the safety catches on their rifles. Van Meer had stopped in his tracks, astonishment on his face. What's this? he appealed. What sort of welcome is this for the Third Army? A mad psyker and a gang of bloodlusty farmhands? No one spoke. Valdez looked at Chuck. The squat's face was an inscrutable mask, but his fingers drew gently against the trigger of his gun. Your Worship, Van Meer implored. We must send word back to Sector Command. The sound of feet pacing carefully on stones behind him. Van Meer's glance flickered briefly rearwards. His eyes were eager, sparkling. Cardinesh, he insisted. 
They could have a ship here for us in a matter of days. Yes, Valdez agreed softly. They could. Further down the path to the village, a second figure stepped from the shadows. Trouble, Sergeant. A little, sir. Van Meer fixed his eyes squarely on the horseman. The Lord Inquisitor's been badly advised. I see. Danielle looked from Valdez to Grunland. The squad captain was staying well back by the cover of the ruined outhouse, his face illuminated peach blonde in a shaft of moonlight. Not to worry, your worship, Grunland shouted to Valdez. We'll leave these elves here to play with their toys. As for the psyker, his gaze rested on Danielle. Maybe she would have been better fitted for the Emperor's table, after all. Grunland smirked contemptuously. The village is clean, sir. Time to move off. Chuck nudged his mouth forward a few paces. Awfully keen to get going, aren't we? Of course. The sooner we... One of the horses suddenly reared. Instinctively, Van Meer spun round, hands slicing down for his gun. Before he reached it, six rifles blazed. The sergeant was picked off his feet and thrown backwards onto the path. Utter silence. Even the horses were still. Van Meer's body twitched, spasmodically at first, and then the spasms became coordinated in movement. Slowly, steadily, the bear-like figure rose to his feet. Even in the darkness there was no doubt most of the bullets had found their mark. The imperial uniform had been torn open across the chest, twisting shards of bone bursting from the ruptured cavity. The lower part of Van Meer's jaw had been blasted away. Remnants of a mouth opened in a cavernous smile, dripping a thick yellow pus. Fear ran through the Cabalian troops like bushfire. Valdez snarled. The bolt pistol spat four rounds before Van Meer had the chance to draw, his features atomized, bone and muscle spewing out in a dark mist. The headless monster toppled and stayed down. Another burst of bolt fire. Chuck was aiming shots at a target further down the path. Grunland. Save it! Valdez commanded. We've lost him for the moment. He gave the order to dismount. The Cabalian riders circled the remains of the sergeant. Then he climbed wearily from the saddle. The Inquisitor beckoned Danielle towards the breach in the wire. Now, here's your chance to serve the Imperium. Can you read any trace of them in there? Danielle closed her eyes to the night and concentrated on the ebb and flow of aura in the village below. She sensed evil stirring like a slow breeze through the blackened buildings but only in a general, enveloping swell of unrest. She couldn't focus it. One thing was sure. However many living men had set foot inside the village, not a flicker of a human soul now remained. I'm sorry, she said. We have to get closer. Valdez grunted, a neutral tone that was neither acceptance nor displeasure. You, he said to Tolman. Is there any other way in? Tolman hesitated, like a thief. Danielle lifted a word from his mind. Mysterious? she asked. Tell us about that. The Cabalian's frightened eyes widened further in amazement. Who gave you that name? You did, she said simply. Now, tell us, Modessa lies in a valley, he explained. But for this road, it's cut off by a deep pool. Mysterious, but the pool may be crossed? It was more assertion than question. The Cabalian looked up at her and rightly guessed it was pointless to deny. There's a crossing of sorts, west of the village, a line of stones. It's said a man with a good eye can leap from one stone to the next. Said? He wrung his hands. No one goes there. The lake stands guard on Mordessa. Sirius is a name from old times. Sirius. A name from old times. From before humanity came to this world. A psychic legacy left for the pioneers. Ancient. Alien words took shape like a warning in Danielle's mind. Stor, Inya, Rach, the one who waits. She thought again of the strange web structures lying in the village. For an instant, her mind filled with another image, a scene frozen in time, plucked from the forgotten age. She saw battle rage amongst the silver-green facades where Modessa now stood. She saw the creatures she recognized, half man, half amphibian, beset by the forces of eternal darkness and she knew their name. Slam. She saw death. The silver structures laid to ruin. Old times, the soldier repeated. Dark times. Legend has it that- I don't want your legends, Valdez interrupted. Times are dark enough now. 
If there's one small chance of getting into that village without walking naked into the hornet's nest, then we shall take it. Coleman lapsed into gloomy silence, but Danielle read the unspoken words in his mind. But the undead? Emboldened by the same sense of doom, a second trooper approached. Sir, wouldn't it be better to return with reinforcements by daylight? Chuck laughed, hoarse and rasping. Daylight? Ha! <laughs> None of us will see daylight again if we turn our backs now. Wise words, Valtus agreed. Whatever abominations are in there, they will not let us go now. We finish them, or they us. Got that? Nine against three. Chuck go to the Cabalians. Aren't the odds good enough for you? He lifted his gun and peered through the sights. What about you? He asked Danielle. Can you weave a spell or two with these? I call on other powers. Valdez loaded another machine clip into his pistol. We'll see about that, won't we? Now, let's move before they cut us down where we stand. They turned off the path and skirted through overgrown woodland rising above and away from the village. The forest was dark, air foul with the reek of grey fungal cancer, matted in a canopy above brittle husks of dead trees, masking off the sky above. Occasional spears of moonlight pierced the gloom, casting pale silver pools amongst the rotting vegetation. Twice the ember glow of watching eyes blinked out on the intruders, but there was no sign of pursuit. At length the path turned downwards again. The forest thinned, the ground grew soft and marshy underfoot. Horse hooves sluiced through the shallow, stagnant ponds. There, down there, Tolman indicated towards the edge of the trees, where moonlight blistered in a stream of water. Mysterious. On the far side of the lake, the dark outlines of Mordessa. Between them and the village, just visible, a line of smooth stones across the water. The crossing would not be easy. Chuck cursed quietly. Let's hope my legs grow a few inches before we get among that lot. Valdez slapped the squat cheerfully on the back. Ah, don't worry, engineer. We'll see if we can't save you a swim. No one swims in there, muttered Tolman. Looking like a man condemned, he began to coax his horse down towards the water's edge. As they passed into the narrow clearing between forest and pool, Danielle felt a white-hot stab of warning. Look out! she shouted. They've seen us! A metallic whine cut open the night. A Cabalian trooper was catapulted from his horse. The others scrambled in the cover of the trees as the young soldier lay shaking on the earth, life pumping from a raw fissure in his guts. Valdez leapt from his horse and dropped to the ground beside Chuck. Foul gods! What was that? Chuck swore and spat a mouthful of dirt. Nightfire rifle, high PSI boots and laser sights. If they've salvaged a couple of those, they're going to pick us off like cattle. The Cabalians loosed off a volley of shots across the water. The answering blast struck Tolman, pulling off an arm like meat ripped from a carcass. The Cabalian captain lay on the ground, screams drowning the echo of the shot. Shut him up. Valdez commanded, or they'll have the lot of us. Danielle cradled the soldier's head in her hands, dulling lobes of pain until death came. As she lowered Tolman's body with a silent prayer, a solid form shifted on the fringes of her mind sight. There, she whispered, I can sense one of them now, across the lake. There's a boathouse at the waterfront. Valdez raised his head a few inches from cover. We'll have to draw him out. No use blasting away the shadows. Seven to three, Chuck commented grimly. A narrow one. Valdez turned at the sound of wood crackling under hooves, just in time to see the horses galloping back into the forest. Make that even odds, engineer. Chuck clambered to his feet. Damnation to him! I've had enough of wallowing on my belly like some beast, he declared. If we're going to draw them out, we have to give them a tasty morsel to aim at. He began to advance. He began to advance into the open. Well, let's hope you shoot better than they do, boss. The dark outline of an imperial guard shimmered in Daniel's mind. He's seen Chuck. He's moving to the door of the house. Aim to the left. Further. The image solidified. She saw Franca squared within the sights of the Imperial. Of the Inquisitor's pistol. Now! Bolt fire streamed across the surface of the pool. The boathouse ignited like tinder. A figure swathed in flame stumbled blindly from the wreckage. Valdez and Chuck fired again, in unison. Gobbets of seared flesh sizzled in the waters of Styrius. Valdez moved back under cover. He glanced up at the grey streaking the sky from the east. The short Cabalian night would soon be ending. They'll want to finish it before dawn. They'll take risks. It could be our best. Our only chance. 
Danielle steeled herself against the carnage of death and searched the distant shoreline afresh. The images were coming more easily as her senses attuned to the dark power. She saw Grunland and Plotfitch moving behind the ruined waterfront houses, moving to opposite ends of the shore. They're spreading apart, she said. I can't focus on both of them. Then concentrate on one. We'll take them as they come. She let her mind force draw her, one image fading as the other came into sharper focus. I see Plotfitch now. He's... he's climbing. There must be a tower. No, the spire. All right. Hold your fire. You may get a look at him this time. The Cabalian moon emerged from a bank of cloud. For an instant, the figure on the spire was clearly illuminated. Shaq sprang from cover, dropping on one knee to take aim. In the same splintered second, Danielle sensed a shadow emerging from the low clump of houses at the other end of the shore. Her warning shout was lost in the crack of weapon fire. Two shots, almost simultaneous. Plotfitch dropped from the spire. His body hammered against the stones and did not move again. Valder struggled to reload his weapon, searching for Grunland. Shaq remained frozen in the hunter's crouch. Get under cover, man, in the Emperor's name. The squat turned, slowly. Blood oozed from a wound set like a red medallion in the centre of his forehead. His lips worked round to reply, but only a trickle of blood-flecked saliva emerged. Shaq's eyes gleamed momentarily, bright with the light of battle, before his head dropped in a warrior's bow. Valdez slammed a last ammunition clip into the bolt pistol. By the Emperor, you will be avenged, he vowed. Jack's gun. See how many rounds are left. Gently, Danielle prized the heavy weapon from their dead comrade's grip. She pulled the magazine from the long, ruined carved gunstock and examined it. No, she said, flatly. Valdez nodded. Then we'd better make these count. The communicator hooked to his belt flashed red. The Inquisitor stared at it in quiet disbelief before flipping the channel open. The screen stayed black. The voice, slurred as if underwater, was Grunland's. Inquisitor, Inquisitor, are you there? We can hear you, said Valdez. Your ammunition must be running out. I have enough to kill you both several times over. You know you can't win. It would be better to surrender now. I promise you. Valdez cut the link. Get a fix on that mutant, he told Danielle. He raised the communicator to his lips, and I promise to send you back to hell. Danielle watched him turning the pistol slowly in his hand, weighing every shot. Both of them knew Grunland was almost certainly right. A grinning death mask blossomed in her mind. Soon, Psyker, I'll have your soul. She shivered. The phantasm was gone, but so too was the image she'd been tracking. I've lost him, she said. He, it, it, must be shielding itself from my sight. Then it's coming for the kill. Valdez got to his feet. Come on, we'll have to take chances too. Before Danielle could follow, she was thrown back to the ground as though a great fist had struck her down. Dazed, she tried to sit up, but her strength had vanished. She looked down at the blood streaming across her tunic. She was dimly aware not only that she had been hit, but the shot was not intended to kill. Just wound. Not kill. Not yet. She recoiled from the stream of pain and tried to turn her healing powers inwards. The wound was slight. She could close it if only she could calm herself. She saw Valdez running as if in slow motion towards the water's edge. The bolt pistol spat, then jammed. As the Inquisitor tugged on the ammunition clip, a figure appeared on the far shore and stepped onto the stones. Smiling, serenely, Grunland began to leap across. One, two, three. Soon he'd be halfway. The trigger of the bolt pistol locked down again in a dull, dead click. Valdez threw the weapon down, desperation in his eyes as Grunland closed on him with smooth athletic bounds over the stones. The Inquisitor tried his footing on the first white rock, jutting like a fist from the pool. Grunland laughed and spread his arms in welcome. Come on, mortal man! Pit your puny strength against real power! Ice had set in Danielle's limbs. Paralyzed, she lay watching as Valdez jumped to the second stone. Grunland's face was shimmering under the moonlight, contours rippling as if though a pupa was about to burst from a human shell. 
on the plateau. On a plateau of rock no more than six feet across, man and mutant met. Grunland's first blow nearly crippled Valdez, a vicious hammer punch into the bruised ribs below the Inquisitor's chest. Valdez rocked back, fighting to stay up, clawing for a grip on Grunland's throat. Grunland lunged again and missed. For an instant he was off balance. Valdez stabbed at the mutant's eyes, fist cracking hard against a socket. Grunland howled in sudden pain, but grasped his attacker before Valdez could draw back in for another blow, twisting his arm like a rotted branch. The mutant kicked out and knocked the Inquisitor's legs from beneath him, spitting savage curses. Danielle tried to stand. She couldn't even crawl. The mutant was straddling his victim, savouring the moment of victory. Grunland's body was altering now. As the power that held the chameleon mask was channeled into battle, the mark of the Lord of Decay was revealed. Grunland's face began to blister and crack until the skin ruptured like an overripe fruit. Sores opened out over his body, weeping streams of stinking pus into the lake. Danielle gathered her powers into a single image of light and fled from her body towards the mutant. A light broke like a sun in Grunland's mind. The mutant cried out, blinded for an instant by the whiteness. Blinded for an instant by the white light, Valdez connected with a final lunging blow, using his body like a battering ram. Grunland reeled, his feet slipped against the edge of the stone and he fell back into the dark waters of Styrius. It was no more than a brief respite. Within seconds, Grunland had regained his feet, the water barely rising above his thighs, but as he began to wade back towards the rock, the waters around him seemed to boil, rising suddenly around the mutant. Bewildered, Grunland grabbed at the edge of the rock, but the torrent hauled him back. Then, as Daniel watched, the waters seemed to rise up and take shape, Moonlight glinting off the green tinged flanks of a huge amphibious warrior. Grunland thrashed out, but his blows passed through the cold, glistening body without seeming to touch it. The mutant slipped back into the raging foam. As he tried to stand, the warrior's arms encircled him, long, webbed fingers gripping his throat, forcing his body below the waters. The warrior's shape collapsed into the turmoil. The waters began frothing with heavy waves, and then settled. The last thing Danielle saw before unconsciousness took her were the dying ripples on the surface of the lake. Something cold and hard was pressed beneath her ribs where she lay. The Inquisitor's bolt pistol. She must have reached it before she passed out. Delicately, as though she was made of brittle glass, Danielle coaxed her bruised body until she was sitting upright. She pulled the torn fabric of her tunic apart and inspected the wound. She would keep the scar forever, but the wound was healed and dry. She looked up and saw Valdez, wading slowly through the shallows to the shore. He saw her watching him and tried to straighten his beaten body. The Inquisitor cursed and hugged his pains, pain crushing his efforts. It was a while before he would look at her again. The mutant? he asked finally. Gone. There's no doubt of that. She remembered torments and spoke in fear of what lay below the waters of the lake, of the one who waits, the spirit guardian of the fallen slam, waiting for the time of revenge. Valdez gazed back across the pool. So, it's finished. The infection is destroyed. Her grip around the pistol tightened. Maybe, she said. Something was wrong with Valdez, or rather, with her perception of him, she reached out to his mind and realized, with a shock, that her powers had gone. Valdez stepped towards her. What is it? Why are you looking at me like that? You fought the mutant. There was contact. Valdez made a clumsy grab for the weapon, swearing as she drew back. Don't be so foolish. Use your psyche's eyes. You can see plain enough what I am. Danielle looked. All she saw was the semblance of a man. Suddenly, she understood the universe, the dark, sightless universe where only a few were given mind sight. And she understood the ways of the blind men who must guard the gateways of the Imperium. And put in your tunic, she said, leveling the pistol. Valdez stared at her as though she were mad. Finally, he drew back the thick fold of cloth covering his flank. A thick, bloody syrup oozed from lacerations where the mutant blows had struck. How do I know the infection hasn't been stemmed? How do I know it hasn't reached you? 
she forced herself to hold his gaze. Tell me, she demanded. What would an inquisitor do? Enough of this rubbish. Let's contact the raft and I might just forget about it. He took another step forward. Danielle raised the pistol until it was aimed squarely at his face. Valdez halted. A half-smile crossed his face. That pistol, he said. It's jammed. Was jammed. And how can you suddenly be so sure of that? Danielle felt a tightening in her throat. I can't. Slowly, Valdez extended his one strong arm towards her. Danielle squeezed the trigger. The face on the screen pulled back, eyes widening in disbelief. Dead, Colin repeated. The chief, too. Danielle paused, then nodded firmly. He gave his life in the service of the Emperor. Whatever Gollan was feeling was hidden from Danielle, behind the stark lines of his fealty mask. Okay, he said at last. Looks like you're in charge. I've reached Cardinash on the freighter circuit. They'll have a military channel patched in in a few minutes. What's the message going to be? A breeze rustled in the trees, freshening the air. Only the faintest shiver now disturbed the calm of the lake. The dead warriors of the ancient slan had taken their token revenge. The spirit guardian lay again at rest, waiting, waiting for the cycle of battle to begin again. A battle without beginning, or without end. And now she was part of it. Danielle looked around the new world of uncertainties that, for the moment, she must walk through. The flower of evil had been cut down, but what of the root, what of the chaos infection born on the warp storm to Kabalas? That that seed of evil had been destroyed? Well, could I tell them everything's all right? No, no, wait for the military channel to be restored, then put them through to me. I'll tell them what needs to be done. In the meantime, get some help down here. She looked at the bodies of Valdez and the two soldiers. There's work that needs finishing. Something glinted in the reeds close to Valdez's body. Danielle bent down and picked up the tiny silver shield, badge of high office of the Inquisition. She placed it deep within a pocket, where she could be sure it would not be lost. Thank you, she said. Thank you for testing me, for teaching me the strength that must come from doubt. The communicator pod blinked red again. Sector Command, ready to receive instructions. Seed of Doubt was written by Neil McIntosh, and this fan reading was by Adam Nickel. For more such fan readings, please visit either www.oldoilhouse.co.uk or www.grufflodge.weebly.com. Thank you for listening.